Good morning. I'm Pastor Amanda, and I am delighted to be able to worship together with you all this morning. Everyone who is here in the sanctuary, everyone who is worshiping online, what a joy and a delight to be together on this beautiful December day. There are some things coming up and for uh, in ministry yet this month, of course, and for one of them, Helen Kershaw will give us a brief announcement. Ladies, this Saturday at 1 o'clock is the Christmas Tea, sponsored by United Women in Faith. Just look around you. There are lots of people who have not been around for a while. This is an opportunity for you to invite someone you've not seen for a while. Or, even better yet, just call somebody up and say, I'm going to come by and pick you up. And this is a wonderful time for fellowship. Christmas tea, Christmas cookies, music, stories, and we have an opportunity for you to bring a favorite nativity set from your own home and put it on display. It can be something unusual, it can be your favorite, or it could be something that's just very precious to you. So hope to see you at the Christmas tea. Thank you very much, Helen. And now I would just direct you mainly to the announcements that have been running before the service and also to the insert in your bulletin to keep track of what's coming up. Next Sunday is the Michael Shearer concert that I have just heard you do not want to miss. That'll be here in the sanctuary at 2. And then be getting your sweet or savory treats to share recipes together because we'll just have that hymn sing and kind of a potluck Come and share your favorite Christmas treats two Sundays from now. And I think that's all my big announcements. So let us just come into the presence of God with the joy and the peace of the season.
And now the Groves family will come and light the Advent candles. King David wrote many praises in the Psalms, including these. Come, children, listen to me. Let me teach you how to honor the Lord. Do you love life? Do you relish the chance to enjoy good things? Then you must keep your tongue from evil and keep your lips from speaking lies. Turn away from evil. Do good. Seek peace and go after it. Peace can be elusive and rarely rests upon us or among us by accident. Peace can be given, but like any gift, it must be received to be of any real use. In this season of giving and receiving, may we pursue peace with tools of generosity and care and incarnation. We light these candles, the candles of joy and peace. Good morning. Would you uh, please rise as you are able and join me in a call of worship. Let us ask for the spirit of wisdom to rest upon us, a spirit of understanding and knowledge. Let us ask God for steadfastness to gird our spirit. May peace prevail like lamb and wolf. Let us ask for voices crying out in the wilderness, women living in fear, children hiding. Let us pray, repent of harm done to the innocent, clear the chaff of abuse and hurt. Let us ask for the God of hope, joy and peace to fill all hearts, one voice glorify. Please remain standing for the hymn of praise, Blessed Be the God of Israel, number 209 in the Red Hymnal.
join you in the unison prayer. Wondrous God, we know that prophets of old put forth bold and broad dreams of your coming. So too may we draw through and now imagine unlikely and precious life possible once more as the divine draws near. The opportunity is ours to be faithful and courageous in our commitment to that incarnation. Amen.
As we share now in the coming moments of prayer, I do uh, have just one extra request that we would send up a few extra prayers for the Drayton family at this time. Uh, Want to just hold them into the presence of God. Also, of course, there are always those things that are on our hearts and on our minds. Whatever it is with the holidays, it could be just about anything, even if it's just what is that menu going to be. Uh, you know, there's lots of stuff that can actually add stress into our lives. And so may God's peace be present in each and every place for whatever we've got going on. Let us pray. Lord, who among us has not experienced some chaos? Maybe it hasn't been in the last, you know, few minutes. <laughs> Though for some of us, maybe it has been. Sometimes getting ready for church and getting here can be its own kind of chaos, its own kind of whirlwind. But God, we know that you are a God who brings order to the chaos of our lives that somehow, beyond our understanding, you bring peace. You don't always settle all the, the dust that's flying around us, but you can and do and will settle the hearts within us. And God, sometimes our hearts are hard to settle down, and we don't have enough what we might call just willpower or something to do it ourselves. So you have your own beautiful spirit that you send to us for peace. You also have the gift of family, friends, pets, who can also be that connection that somehow calms our hearts, whether with words or a hug or a boop on the nose, whatever it is, God, in our own little ways of relating to each other, you know that there are ways that we comfort each other very well. And God, it is for all of that I really pray today for we, your people. In the big ways and in the small ways, may you show yourself, reveal yourself to be the God of peace. Scripture proclaims that you are and that we have had some experience and know you to be. And now we pray together in the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now I would love for the kids to come join me for the children's message. Handheld number two. Handheld, there we go. Handheld number two. All right, I'll come. You all like the stairs, and so I'll come down and sit at the steps with you. I was a little prepared differently with my game today. Did anybody get to play a game with your family this past week of some kind? Well, if you don't have time for a board game, just go ahead and initiate a game of tag. That one's easy to start, right? Tag, you're it. Oh, I'm it again, okay. Well, does anybody recognize this game? Connect four, yes, that's right. Do you, how do you win this game? You have to get four in a row. Does it ha have to go a special direction? It can go across or up and down or diagonal. Now, to get my illustration ready for today, I played a game of Connect Four against me. I was both the red and the black, so I both won, woohoo, and lost. Oh. But it was kind of fun, you know, to put together because I blocked myself and then I caught myself. The black checkers, I guess they are. Can you see the, the win where the diagonal is, the four diagonals? It caught up on me on the, from the red side. And you know, this game of Connect Four is kind of like John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. 
Because he, scripture said, that one would come and make the paths straight for the Messiah. And so John came and he preached. And so maybe, he, you know, he was kind of one who built the foundation so that Jesus could just come and have a big old win. And when Jesus came, he baptized people with the Holy Spirit. He brought the Holy Spirit to us. And so John the Baptist was important as one who prepared the way for Jesus. Now, when you're playing a game like Connect Four, even when you're playing to win, sometimes do you set the other person playing up to win? Like whether you like it or not, sometimes even on accident. So sometimes we don't even know that we're setting someone else up for a win, even when we're just living our own little lives, making our own choices. And I think that's kind of cool because you all, the way that you live your lives, you know, you're here in church and you are worshiping and you're learning about God and you're asking good questions about living a life of faith. And then the way you go and live your life, you may not even know that you are setting someone else up for knowing Jesus. And I just think that's pretty cool to think about, particularly at Christmas time. I know, can you believe it? I'm seeing this face up here. Can you believe that you living your life might set up someone else to know Jesus for themselves? to know and be loved, that know that they are loved by God. I think that's pretty cool. So just keep living your life and be loved by God, and I think someone else just may experience that love too. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for certainly John the Baptist who set the stage and, and made a clear path for Jesus, for Jesus who came and he preached and he loved people. He did so much to get to know us by being born and living just like we live. So God, help us this Christmas season to also live lives that make a, a path that other people can walk to meet Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, you all may go back to your people. And now, I would love for us to stand as we are able, and we'll sing the first four verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
our God, architect of this world and all others. We know you had a vision for all your creation to dwell together. With the creatures of the air, earth, and sea, you long for us to live in respect and with one another. We give this morning understanding that we have denied you that desire. We ask you to help us use who we are and what we have to heal this abused and broken world. In Christ our Savior, amen.
You may be seated. Our scripture lesson today is found in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. Whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we could have hope through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures. May the God of endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude toward each other similar to Christ Jesus' attitude. That way you can glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ together with one voice. So welcome each other in the same way that Christ also welcomed you for God's glory. I'm saying that Christ became a servant of those who are circumcised for the sake of God's truth in order to confirm the promises given to the ancestors and so that the Gentiles could glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, because of this I will confess you among the Gentiles and I will sing praises to your name. And again it says, rejoice Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord all you Gentiles and all the people should sing his praises. And again Isaiah says, there will be a root of Jesse who will also rise to rule the Gentiles. The Gentiles will place their hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in faith so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. That verse four, whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we could have hope through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures. Kind of a cool line, right? I mean, that's a whole thing. Why do we have the scriptures? To instruct, yes. But what are those instructions for? The instructions found in the scriptures, according to Paul here, are written so that we can have hope. Not so that we can have shame or just have control or have our lives just perfect, but so that we can have hope. And that hope, it comes through endurance, which is an action that we take while being encouraged by the scriptures. And, you know, you might know this already. You folks have been to church a couple of times. But I find it reassuring to be reminded that the scriptures weren't written as a magnifying glass for identifying our flaws. I love that the scriptures have been written to help us to encourage us, to keep us taking those actions that add up to endurance over the long haul. This is a good word to us in the Advent season as we are waiting in anticipation for the Christ child. I mean, I don't know about you, but I never get tired of Jesus being born. I know that it is ancient history in the linear movement of time, but somehow it also happens every year in my way of experiencing the fullness of the goodness of God. I kind of hope that's true for you as well. That's why we gather, right, on Christmas Eve especially. And this text is really beautiful as it is paraphrased by Eugene Peterson. So I'm going to go ahead and read it again, but in this paraphrase, so that you can hear this really friendly, warm language for these words as well. He shares it as this. Even if it was written in scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. God wants the combination of his steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel in scripture to come to characterize us, keeping us alert for whatever he will do next. May our dependably steady and warmly personal God develop maturity in you so that you get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. Then we'll be a choir. Not our voices only, but our very lives singing in harmony to a, in a stunning anthem to the God and Father of our Master Jesus. So reach out and welcome one another to God's glory. Jesus did it. Now you do it. Jesus, staying true to God's purposes, reached out in a special way to the Jewish insiders so that the old ancestral promises would come true for them. 
As a result, the non-Jewish outsiders have been able to experience mercy and to show appreciation to God. Just think of all the scriptures that will come true in what we do. For instance, then I'll join outsiders in a hymn sing. I'll sing to your name. And this one, outsiders and insiders rejoice together. And again, people of all nations celebrate God. All colors and races give hearty praise. In Isaiah's word, there's the root of our ancestor Jesse breaking through the earth and growing tree tall, tall enough for everyone everywhere to see and take hope. Oh, may the God of green hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, so that your believing lives, filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit, will brim over with hope. Church, the way Peterson weaves these particular words together, I believe, stays true to the movement of the text, and it conveys that truth in a way that, to me at least, it feels kind of warm and snugly. His words have a way of kind of wrapping around that message. It may not hit you all the same way, and that's totally fair, but I hope that hearing multiple presentations of the text might move us from just an intellectual engagement with what Paul writes toward more of an engagement of the heart. Because when it comes down to it, it's the heart that drives us. The intellect is important, and I say that as someone who can wildly overextend mine, <laughs> but the heart is where we keep our dearest loves, our wildest dreams, our most fervent hopes, and also our most tender wounds, our deepest disappointments, and our darkest fears. And whether it's intentional and with the cooperation of our intellects or not, it's those things that the heart holds which moves us toward others or away from them. God would have us receive what we need from the one who is the source of all love and goodness so that we can, with great courage and endurance, move toward each other to the glory of God. And isn't that kind of a wonderful way to envision engaging in community and relationships? It isn't about bringing glory to me or to you or to United Methodism or any denomination, but to God. Welcoming people into the community of faith is about bringing glory to the God who knows and loves each and every one. I think of it particularly maybe in this time of year, of family gatherings. You know, this idea of coming together to God's glory and not just to our specific agreement or, or glory. There's a very specific kind of family gathering when all the generations gather for the love of, say, a matriarch, you know, the, the grandmother of the family. They might not all get along with each other day to day or approve of each other's choices, and they might have some hurts that happened along the way that need healing, but everybody shows up for Sunday dinner or for the holiday celebration or some other special occasion because the event isn't about them and each and every single one of their uh, interactions with each other, but it's about that head of the family, whom for us is Christ the Lord. It's perfectly acceptable and normal for people who don't always agree on every detail of life to gather also to the glory of God. There is full integrity in engaging in peace together without perfect agreement, but agreement always on the goodness of God and the love of Jesus and the ongoing fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we forget that peace is not about all people agreeing on everything or all circumstances, you know, every bit of dust settling and everything being perfect, but peace is something that that finds its way into us and among us as we agree on the full humanity of all people and working for each person's good, not needing to come to full agreement on how to approach each and every little detail, because let's just face it, that's unrealistic. That's never going to happen. But we can also struggle to figure out how to access the peace of God that God would gladly place within us. And I find that 
some words that'll probably be familiar to, to some of us from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. It encourages us in this direction. It says, don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. And from now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Friends, the peace of God does exceed our understanding, I believe. Or I haven't been able to wrap my head fully around it yet. But God's gift of peace isn't a matter for the intellect to grasp, but for the heart to experience and to feel. And so as we move together to the celebration of communion today, I invite us to approach with an engagement not just of our heads, but very much of our hearts as well. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. 
by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now if you prefer to receive the elements there in your pew with one of the, the little prepared uh, elements, then feel free to open your wafer and your juice and, and receive the body and blood of Christ. We do have elements here for those who would like to come forward for intinction. So, Dwayne, if you'd grab the cup, and we'll do this together.
Now, I would invite you all to stand as you are able, and we will sing It Came Upon the Midnight Clear, number 218 in your red hymnal. today in the peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.